And let's pray first, O oh God, thank you for this time that we have together and being able to worship you and praise you. Thank you for your word. And we pray that we will learn from it and grow and be blessed. So uh, with that in mind, open up our hearts and minds to receive your word, to understand it, and also to apply it to our lives, which is what this parable seems to be most about. So bless us as we do so, and we seek you, and help me to do an honorable job here in Jesus' name, we pray, amen. Okay, uh, I just came from the church, Woodland United Fellowship. I teach a Sunday school class there at time. So that went from 9 to 9.50, so here I am. <laughs> so I might be, I hope I don't get in the first Kings. That's what I'm teaching over there. But uh, we'll do Matthew 7 today uh, and see what we can do. As you know, there's a little bit of archaeology. I, have, I can't speak unless I throw in some archaeology for you. But let's read this parable in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Ask. Oh, I'm sorry. Matthew chapter 7, verses. I'm sorry. I said this doesn't look right at all. 24 through 29. Although I did. That's a good one. Uh, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority, not as their scribes. And that's basically what this is about, the authority of the teachings of Jesus and what authority does that have in our own lives now Jesus parable here is about two men and the two men had some things in common they both had heard the teaching of Jesus they both embarked on a project they both made choices they both encountered a storm and apparently it was the same storm you have two men facing the same storm. Now, obviously, this is a parable. So it's a, he's actually talking about two men and their relationship to his teachings and what they do with them in their lives. He goes on. In the story, the project they embarked on was the task of building a house. Some of you are builders. You worked on in contracting and things like that, or you've had a house built, or you, we all live in one that's been built. In which, of course, this is an analogy <clears throat> for the life that each one of us creates for ourselves. And so the two men who both built homes, one chose to build on bedrock. The second man built his house on sand. And this would have been a story that would have the people nodding. Oh yeah, we know about that. We know about how to build a house, whether it's you have a good foundation or you don't. And it made complete sense in their culture in their time and, and geography as well. You built a house with a solid foundation, even back then. You did not build a house on sand. Let me uh, show you some of these slides that I have just to show you. Let's go to the first one. Yeah, this is to show you that in the earliest of times, men knew you build your house on a rock foundation. Now I have covered this at Tala Hamam and this is from the Calcolithic period, this is maybe 5,000 years ago. This, you're getting right at the flood at this point, very, very soon after that. This is some of the first settlements by Ham and his descendants afterwards. And you see what they did, there's rocks underneath, that's the foundation, and then you have mud brick on top of that, and the walls would go up, they're called uh, longhouses. And this is very early, but the point is, this is built on top of the bedrock. Even the stones, they had a foundation that was on bedrock. Go to the next slide, you can see it a little 
clear as to how this works. This is the same, you can see the hole up in the corner, that's where the picture was taken. But the, uh, go ahead and do the next, uh, you know, give you some info. And the next one too, there you go. And you have a, you have a fan, I'm on, did I do something? I'm on, okay. They have a foundation with a uh, calculated broadhouse. And then the later period, early bronze people, a few hundred years after that, they rebuilt on top using the same foundation. But they knew foundation was important. Go and see it in the next picture. I also, this was my last period of digging. This is the time of Abraham. And this was the city where Sodom was destroyed. When you see the wall that I uncovered, it's a, it's a, a, up to, it's about eight, six, it was seven feet wide. It's very solid. And the point is, it's lasted all these years. That's, that's the whole point of it. It's built on top of a firm foundation. Foundations are important. Go to the next picture. This was a temple, 10 feet wide walls. You could build 50, 60 feet on top of this. And the point is, again, all these have firm foundations. The foundations are still here. They're still here after all these thousands of years. Well, what happens when you don't build a house on a foundation that's firm? Look at the next one. Uh-oh. The house was built on sand. Go to the next picture. Sand. Go to the next picture. Sand. <laughs> next picture. Ah. Now this house, this is rock. You see rock on one side, rock on the other side. It's a rock foundation. And the house is made out of rock. So that house is going to be there quite a while. I'll see what I did. I've got to use the two microphones there, aren't I? Okay. Or is this one working and that one's working too? It's not working. Then I won't use it. Can I take it off? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I see the lights even out. Okay. I don't need to look back anymore anyhow. Now, these are William Barclay, the commentator. He wrote his daily Bible study, the study Bible. There was many at Goli, which in summer was a pleasant sandy hollow. It was in winter a raging torrent of rushing water. A man might be looking for a place to build a house. He might find a pleasantly sheltered sandy hollow. He might think this was a very suitable place, but if he was a short-sighted man, he might well have built his house in the dried up bed of a river. And when the winter came, his house would disintegrate. And I have been to many a site in Israel, close to a river, that didn't survive because they didn't understand that the bank would overflow its banks. And uh, many a church was built during the Byzantine period down by the Jordan River. They were eliminated. They kept moving back away from the water. Now, ultimately, in this parable, both men made uh, decisions, decisions that would dramatically affect the quality of their lives later. And Jesus explains very clearly what he is trying to say. He didn't beat around the bush. He didn't sugarcoat the message here and his words. And he, he says, like in verse 24 and 26, he said, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is what? Wise. But anyone who hears my teaching and ignores it is foolish. Notice that he doesn't say the men were smart or stupid. He doesn't use that type of terminology because smart and stupid aren't the same as wise and foolish. And the reason is we've all met people who are incredibly smart. We give them credit for that. But they're dumb as dirt when it comes to making practical decisions in life. I had a, one of my best buddies in college, well, maybe because he might be looking at him. And, uh, that man was the most intelligent man as far as smarts. He could, I would study and cram all night, he'd spend an hour before that he'd remember. And uh, he'd, he could play an instrument. He was just incredible. But he didn't have any sense of doing with people at all. He had no idea how to get along with people. He just in another world. He had, he was, he was just, uh, you'd be the guy that said, well, you're done with the dirt when it comes to great practicality in life. And so one of these men, the wise man, he hears the teaching of Jesus and he chooses to make those teachings the foundation of his life. And even though it's not 
necessarily the easier choice or even the popular choice. He did it. And then the second man, he heard the same message, same storm, the same, same message, and they faced the same storms. But he made a different decision about what he would do with that message. And he chose to ignore the message, and we don't know what his philosophy was about life and what he built his life on, but we do know what it wasn't built on. And that was, it wasn't built on the teachings of Jesus Christ. And Jesus tells us that the foolish man made his decision to ignore the teachings of Christ for the same reason the foolish man built his house on sand. It was easier, okay? It was convenient. And he wasn't looking to the future. So that's where a lot of people are. He was just concerned with the here and now. Hey, this is a good spot to build. Nice weather. Let, let, let's do it. No storm on the horizon. Now in this parable, Jesus, first of all, he demands that people listen to his message. Then he demands that people do something with what they heard. And knowledge only becomes relevant when it is translated into action. So let's look at the first point, and I'll have it on the screen. And that's pretty simple. Storms will come. Okay, you can't get away from it. Storms will come. Regardless of how nice the weather is when you build a house, you can be assured that at some point the storm's going to come. And it's the same thing with life. Your life may seem just right now. But the chances are that at some place in your future, a storm will come. Now, most of us have already been through storms in our lives. But that doesn't mean you're done with them. As long as you're alive, you got more to come. Now, I don't want to sound real negative here, but uh, something realistic. You see, illness comes, um, loss of income comes, COVID things come, <laughs> relationships sour in our lives. Your storm will come in many forms. And with that in mind, what may be a storm to you is a, just a mild sprinkle to others. It's how you handle it, where you look. But with that in mind, I want you to listen to the promise that Jesus made to his followers in John 16, 33. He says, I have told you all this, so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. You see, Jesus even said that in this life, here on earth, what's going to happen? They're going to have some storms. They're going to come your way. But he says, take heart. Your strength is in the fact that you have overcome the world. How do they do that? Through the word of God and the teachings of Jesus. Let's go to the next point. And this is the best time to prepare for a storm is before the storm. All right? It's kind of like the old guy who never fixed his roof. Because when it was sunny, it wasn't leaky. And when it was raining, it was too wet to work on it. So we never got around to fixing it. And a lot of people are that way with life. You see, the time to prepare for the storm is when the sun's out. When things are well. When things are good. The best time to build a house <clears throat> and to build a life is when the storm isn't raging around you. The problem is to make people wait too long. They wait till things are just out of hand. They say, oh God, help me. I better follow the word of God. Well, the middle of a raging storm isn't when you should be putting a roof on your house. In the middle of a snowstorm, I don't have snow down here up in the mountains we do, is when you should be discovering you should you forgot to put in the storm windows instead of the screens. Or you didn't go out and get any firewood and set it aside. You're covered with snow now. Many think that they can just wait life out and put off making any positive spiritual decisions about Jesus and I will have plenty of time when I get older to do that sort of thing. I have plenty of time when I get older to think about Jesus. And in the meantime, I will do my life my way without any interference from God. Jesus told another parable about that. And that's in Luke 12, 16 through 21. Listen to this one. This is one of the hardest hitting parables Jesus talked about. He said, the ground of a certain rich man <clears throat> 
produced a good crop. And he thought to himself, well, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. But there I will store all my grain and my goods. I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. <clears throat> I had a very uh, real experience with that. I think I shared it with you one time before. When my wife's father, my father-in-law, was on his deathbed. And he had been a man that could care less about anything spiritual all his life. And he loved things. Oh, he loved cars, he loved houses, he loved electronic contraptions, everything that money could buy. He was in great debt <laughs> because he loved everything money could buy and he spent it. But at the same time, uh, he didn't talk at all about Jesus while well, he's dying. And um, I was thinking of this parable even at that time. What does it profit a man? He gains a whole life and yet he loses his own soul. And in this case, what, what's going to happen? So I, when I spoke to him on his deathbed, I was the last person to talk to him, and I, I said, Mike, you know what? You're going to die. And he didn't want to hear that. He said, how, how do you know that? And I said, well, the doctor said. He said, oh, how long do I have? I said, you got hours. And uh, he said, he let out a cuss word. <laughs> and, I, and I said, I want to ask you a question. Um, do you want to go to heaven or do you want to go to hell? And he thought, you see, he didn't come back. He didn't want to be thinking about his material possessions at that point. He, that was, he could care less about that stuff. He didn't even bring it up. His, his hot car and his house and everything. I mean, he had a really nice car. He hadn't driven it in a year. He just got in the driveway looking at it. Because that was his baby. Anyhow, I asked him, I said, he said, well, I want to go to heaven. And I said, well, you want to know how? He said, yes. So I told him. I gave him, let him to plan of salvation, how Jesus died because he was a sinner. I said, you believe you're a sinner? He said, boy, I've done a lot of bad, bad, bad things. I said, yeah. And uh, he admitted he was a sinner. And he said, I need forgiveness. I really do. And I explained Jesus to him. And ultimately at the end, and I said, you want to receive Jesus as your, as your Savior for your sins. And for what life you have, give it to him. For what life you have left. And he said, that's all. That's what I need. I really want. So anyhow, uh, I said a prayer. And at the end of the prayer, I said, Mike, is this what you want to happen in your life? And he said, yes, yes. I need Jesus. And uh, those were his last words. Here is a man who really was living this parable. He told him everything going, but he only lived for this world. His foundations were all messed up. He had no foundations. And what happened, like Jesus says, this, uh, who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Well, we got it, we had to dispose of it. And it went all over the place. But we didn't need any of it. You know, it meant nothing to us. And that's the whole point. So Jesus was so right on here. Foundations with your life throughout your entire life. So the time for it to be preparing your foundation isn't when you just found out that you're sick or uh, unemployed or there are problems with your kids. The time is now. It's often been said that the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. And also, the second best time is now. That's true. That's true. So you shouldn't have started laying the foundation of your life. Uh, uh, you, you should have started. You shouldn't wait until now. You should have started laying the foundation of your life a long time ago. But the message is, if you didn't, we'll start today. That's the good news of the gospel of Jesus. You can start anytime. Third point, your foundation is important 
in the storm. Now, Luke's account of this parable is uh, a little different from Matthew. In Luke 6, 48 and 49, it says, It's like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. And when the floodwaters rise and break against the house, it stands firm because it is well built. Then he says, But anyone who hears and does obey is like a person who builds a house <clears throat> without a foundation. He just explains it very clearly. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. Now, when I was a kid, uh, my dad would tell me to do something. And it could be just about anything, wait in a certain place, do my homework, come in the house, it's late, get to do the chores that I need to clean your, clean your room, whatever. And I would always hear him tell me those things. I would always hear it. But that didn't mean that I always did it. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And when he would come to check on me to see whether I had completed the task he had laid out for me, only to find that I hadn't even started on it, well, you know what he would say in a rather frustrated tone. He would ask, did you hear what I said? Well, the answer is obvious. Now, he knew before he had asked, but yes, I heard every word. <laughs> And uh, it wasn't my hearing that was the problem. The problem was when he asked, had I heard him, that was not the problem. But what he meant was that to hear meant that I should obey. You get it? And that's what Jesus is really making clear in this parable. And it's very clear when he says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them, will be like a wise man. Now simply hearing then, for you and I, is not enough. We have to put what we have heard into practice. And it is the path to wisdom. The person who doesn't, uh, that is, as Jesus says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, he or she, Jesus says, you're plunging into folly. Now the idea of folly comes from fool, and the Bible is very clear that we're not talking about ignorance. We're talking about fool, the Bible says, only the, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. And you demonstrate your lack of a God in your life by what you do. And uh, so James addresses the same, uh, the same matter in his little book, and he's addressing those who are not wise, they're foolish. They don't have a foundation in their life but the Word of God. So here's what he says, be doers of the Word. In, his, in James 1, 22 and following. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. I mean, that's, that's a big statement. I mean, who's a bigger fool? That the person who lies to himself and believes his own lie. That's weird. But that's what we're talking about. James goes on, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, He's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer that forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So uh, this is where the Bible speaks with one voice on this issue. Hear what Jesus says. And then do what you have heard, put it into practice, and you'll be blessed. If you don't, the consequences can be very severe. And it can lead to a messed up life and ultimately even hell. So the next point, and that is the results of the storm will differ for each of us. That's very clear. Because both men went through the storm, the same storm. One man's house stood, the second man's house fell. Why would anyone build a house on sand? In that, why would they do that? Which is to ask, why would anyone build a life on an unstable foundation? Which means the things this world offers, the philosophies of the world as opposed to the teachings of Christ. Let's go further. Why would anyone build their life on worldly things and philosophies instead of God and his word, the Bible? Why would anyone continually reject 
the message of real life and light and salvation and forgiveness that is found in Jesus Christ. Why do good people do that? Yet more people do that than those who will say yes to Christ. More people reject. The answer, again, is simple and it's easier, and it's the way that most people do it. They, uh, what did Jesus say happened to the house built on sand when the storm came up? It fell. And not only that, it's very descriptive. It, it says that great was the fall of it. And in other words, there wasn't just a little structural damage to the life. The house was washed away and reduced to rubble. Do you want to have that as the outcome of your life is what Jesus is saying. And you and I know, you, you have loved ones, their lives are just a mess. Just a mess. Friends and people, and you look on the news and you see things going on and say, what is wrong with those people? <laughs> Maybe your own life is there. I don't know. I don't know you that well. But at the same time, the answer uh, is, is always in Christ. And you, in, in other words, there wasn't just a little structural damage. And the, the question is, do you, do you want that to be the outcome of your life? Well, no. None of us want that to be the outcome of our lives. But does that mean you have to listen to Jesus? and do what he says? The answer is yes. Obviously, Proverbs 10, 25, wisdom literature, says when the storm has swept by, the wicked are gone, but the righteous stand firm forever. Well, think about that. The righteous are those who believed in God. They trusted in his word, and they're going to stand firm. No matter what the storm does, they're going to stand firm. Let's get into the finally here, what we have to look at this in the, the last point. And that is, uh, and this is most important, God is with us in the storm. And maybe you're wondering, well, where is that said in the story? Where does it say God's with us in the storm? Well, remember how the story began. Matthew 24, 7, 24, Jesus said, Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise like a person who builds a house on solid rock. So we are really talking not about houses. We're not talking about rocks. We're not talking about sand. We're talking about the teachings of Jesus. That's what we're talking about. And in the Jesus teachings, he reminds us so much, so often, about how much God loves us and cares for us and he will always be there for us no matter what we go through. He'll be there. I like it what the prophet Nahum said in Nahum 1 7. said, The Lord is good, a strong refuge when trouble comes. He is close to those who trust in him. So when trouble comes, I need refuge. I don't know about you. I'm a very dependent person. I, a lot of people say that guy's really independent. Well, some of the things I do better when it comes to life, to life in the meaning of life, I am totally dependent upon God. And I do that because it works. That's the main thing. It works. God is with us in the storms. So what does it look like to build your life on the rock? Well, I'm going to mention just a few things. The first thing, if you're building your life on the teachings of Jesus, which is what this parable is really all about. You're going to give attention not only to the outward life, you know, physical things, but to the interior part of your life as well. Because what you do outwardly is fueled by what you think inwardly. How do you think? What's your philosophy? What are you, what, what are you, what are you working with to allow your life to do what it does. Um, you know what you believe, and you maintain those beliefs by living your life accordingly. Now, you are transformed when you come to Christ. The Bible says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Transformed by how? The renewal of your mind. Everything about you changes inwardly, and then your transformation takes place. So 
You are transformed by the renewal of your mind. That happens when you turn to Jesus for forgiveness of sin, confess him as your Lord, and receive the Holy Spirit to help you and guide you in this life. Things change. And your instructions for life then come from the Bible. You don't look to what the evening news says or what some actor or actress says uh, or some good writer says. If they don't know Christ, they're out of it. They don't, they don't have a clue. And they're giving bad advice if they don't include Jesus in it. And your instruction for life comes from the Bible. Proverbs 4, 23 says, Watch over your heart with all diligence. Your heart is the inner part of you. For from it flow the springs of life, which is the outer part of you. I'm going to read a passage in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. And this kind of solidifies what we've been saying here. It says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together and into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. I like what it says. Where does our foundation come from for life? The teachings of the apostles and the prophets. New Testament, Old Testament. They work together to bring about the directions for life that we need. So the Bible is important to build your life on. Next, not only do you cultivate and nurture your inner life, but you also take on an eternal perspective on things. So most people just consider things from a temporary point of view. They live for today and the very near future, or if they think they're gonna live a long time, long-term future, which is not guaranteed in this world. Um, I, we don't know how much time we have left. I, you know, I speak a lot about Sodom and Gomorrah because that's where I dig when I go to Jordan annually. I'll be going again in February. And I, the more I learn about what happened to those people, the more I understand. They were eating and drinking and planning, and just like Jesus said. And, and, then, and then one day, <clears throat> they were going about their, their daily life, and in three seconds, they were done. 20 to 50,000 people, that whole valley, gone. Three to, three to five seconds. That's how long it took. They didn't even know what hit them, and it was over. Completely, totally, everybody, everybody. And uh, the good news is that God has been merciful. Only one time in history has one of those events happened over a populated area, and that was it. God directed it. If it happened again today, what happened to that city in Sodom and Gomorrah, if it happened today by a meteorite air burst, this is what God used to take them out. If it hit LA, 10 million people would die. There would be no buildings left in the entire area. And there, nothing would survive. Nothing. 10 million people. Just like that. Five seconds, it's gone. But God has been merciful, hasn't he? Well, kind of strayed a little bit. Um, the life on the rock <clears throat> means keeping in mind that there's more to life than this life. We're talking about eternity. We're talking about heaven. And living like we believe it's going to happen. It's okay to think about heaven, to read about it, yes, to even long for it. After all, when we're in Christ, we are strangers just passing through this world to enter into the real world, the real life that God has prepared for us after we leave this world and go and be with God in heaven. So I... And to be honest, I think about heaven a lot. And it's with a smile. I don't cling to life in this world, neither should any of us, because it is temporary. But what God has, and I love my life in Christ now. Don't get me wrong, I'm saying, oh, I wish it was over. <laughs> no, I love life. I love what, I, what God has done for me and what he continues to do. But I also believe this is very little. It's like a cloud 
something that a, a mirror dimly that we can't see real clear as to what real life is all about. Anyhow, a third factor in building your life on the rock. You reorder your priorities. You've got to build into your life time for God each and every day. You have, you, if you leave God out of your day, you're not building on the rock, basically. Building uh, on the rock means being in the Bible study, being in church attendance, having a daily quiet time with the Lord, prayer, serving in the church, the body of Christ. And in the end, a life lived for Jesus is much more rewarding than a life lived for any other cause. No one in heaven is going to care about your golf school. No one in heaven is going to care about how much money you had in the bank. Nobody in heaven will care what car you drove or where you live. Those things are fine in this world, but your reward in heaven will have more to do with the time you spent serving God and being with his people uh, in prayer, the kingdom work you did, the sacrifices you made for Jesus, the beauty not of your body but of your spirit, the love you gave, the kindness you showed, the souls you shared Christ with. That's where the real values are. And besides all that, living for Jesus is what you were made for. You were created for this, to give glory to God. Now, most people will build their houses or their lives on the sand. It's just the way it is. Jesus said it's a very narrow way leading to the kingdom. And it's really wide, and much more people go that direction that leads to destruction. They will live for immediate gratification rather than long-term satisfaction. And they will always have their own wants and needs in view and seldom consider the wants and needs of others. They will never be satisfied with life, and they will die disappointed and hopeless. They will face the judgment of God without excuse at all. But I pray, not you or anyone that I know, even if you've built your house on the sand. It's not too late. That's the wonderful gospel. Today you can make the change that makes the difference. You can be like the wise man who built his house on the rock. And if you've never accepted the forgiveness and the grace of Jesus Christ, those promises are actually just a prayer away. It's so simple and easy. The time to be preparing your foundation isn't when you just found out again that you were ill or you're unemployed or there are problems with your kids. The time is now. And I pray you'll start now. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your message. Thank you for what you showed us through your word. And then we pray you will bless us as we continue to honor you and sing and uh, just worship with you. Help us to cling to your word and to be blessed by doing so. We pray that those who are here and know you, they will just focus now even more so on the foundation that you want them to have and what you offer through your word. And for those who may not be and they're struggling and they're saying, you know, I've built my foundation in the wrong place and the wrong things, I pray they'll make that change today and they'll be blessed too. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.